generally reflect those of Sonix Incorporated or CKRs that are found. to another edition of the Health Beat Radio Show here at CKRZ. I'm El Sue, and I'm joining us this week on the Health Beat Radio Show. We have the Director of Six Nations Health Services, Lori Davis-Hill, and the Shrinkham Public Health Nurse in Charge, Deb Jonathan, and uh, they are both going to be bringing us uh, some topical information regarding uh, COVID-19 and as well as some updates pertaining to uh, Six Nations. Welcome, ladies. Yeah. Yeah. Scano Six Nations, uh, I hope this message finds you at home, healthy, and safe with your families. Like Al said, I'm, my name is Lori Davis-Hill. I'm the director of Six Nations Health Services, and <clears throat> we're going to be joining you over this next hour to give you some updates. I'm also joined by Deb Jonathan, and we're here to provide you with updates about our strategies to combat and control COVID-19 in our community. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to say now I'm to thank each and every one of you for your courage and patience and for the dedication you have shown in our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of our public health team, health services, emergency control group, and community leaders have asked a lot from our community over the last month, completely transforming the ways most of us live and work. We realize that this has been difficult, but we want you to know that these actions and sacrifices are based on the advice of top scientists and healthcare professionals from around the world. The measures have been proven to protect the health and safety of other communities and countries, saving the lives of the people living in them, especially the most vulnerable. Our public health team has been watching the ways other communities have been fighting this virus, looking at what has been effective and what has not. Ideas and strategies are brought to the Emergency Control Group and the Six Nations Grand Rural Elected Council for discussion and planning, and decisions are made in the best interest of the members of this community. Today, we'll be discussing some of those strategies. Deb, can you tell us about the Six Nations COVID-19 Assessment Center? Yeah, well, Lori. The Six Nations COVID-19 Assessment Center was approved by the Ministry of Health on April the 3rd and officially opened in our community on Monday, April 6th. It consists of three parts, an information and assessment center, the drive-through testing site, and a triage area. And let me explain each part. The Information and Assessment Center can be reached seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. by calling 226-446-9909. You can also reach us toll-free by calling 1-855-977-7736. If you call during off hours, you will still reach an after hours answering service that will put you in contact with a community nurse. If you have general questions about COVID-19, please call these numbers. You will reach a nurse who can answer your questions. And if you have concerns about symptoms, again, please call these numbers. A nurse will complete a telephone assessment asking you questions about your health history, any medications you may be on, what your symptoms are, when they started, if you've traveled anywhere, or whether you've been around anyone who has traveled and is displaying respiratory symptoms. We will also ask you whether you've been in contact with a positive or probable case of COVID-19 that you may know of. If the nurse feels that you require a COVID-19 test, your file will be forwarded to a physician who will review the nurse's assessment and provide the order for a test. The nurse will then call you with a date and time for your appointment at the drive-through test site. Thanks, Deb. Can you explain what a symptom is and what symptoms are associated with COVID-19? Yes. Lori, the symptoms were actually just updated by the Ministry of Health on April the 8th, 2020. 
I want to stress that community members should call the assessment center if they are experiencing any one of the following symptoms. A fever, which is a temperature of 37.8 degrees Celsius or higher. If you don't have a thermometer, if you're experiencing chills followed by sweats, that may mean that you're experiencing a fever. Also, any new or worsening acute respiratory illness symptoms, such as a cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, runny nose or sneezing, nasal congestion, a hoarse voice, difficulty swallowing, or if you've been told that you have pneumonia through clinical or radiological evidence, such as an x-ray. There are also atypical symptoms of COVID-19, and these happen particularly in elderly people and children. So testing should be considered if these people are experiencing any of these atypical symptoms, which are unexplained fatigue or tiredness, difficulty feeding in infants and babies, delirium, which is an acutely altered mental status, or maybe a child might be inattentive if they're, they don't have an attention span for anything. Falls for the elderly. Also in elderly, we might see an acute functional decline. Things that they were able to do before, they might not be able to do anymore. An exacerbation or worsening of somebody's chronic conditions. Also digestive symptoms, such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal pain, chills, headaches, and croup. I realize that this list is long and could really be a presentation of many different types of illnesses. However, I want to stress that having any one of these symptoms could also be the beginning of the COVID-19 illness in you or your loved one. So it is very important to get tested and know for sure what you're dealing with before it may progress to something much worse. So if I have some of these symptoms and I've called in, I've been given a date and time for an appointment, what happens next? Okay, so yes, the nurse will call you with a date and time for a drive-through test appointment. The drive-through test site is open Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and it's located in front of the community hall. You will be told to bring a piece of identification, such as a health card or status card, so that we can verify that it is you we are testing. As you approach the testing site, we'd like you to put your ID on the dash. When you pull into the testing site, we ask that you roll your window down put your vehicle into park and turn off the ignition. The nurse will give you a mask to put on and you will put it on and expose only your nose for the test. Don't panic, you will see the nurse approach your vehicle in full personal protective equipment or PPE as we call it. And this will include a full body suit, boots, a gown and gloves. They will also have a mask and a face shield on. So this PPE is needed to protect them against any infectious secretions they may come into contact with while doing the test. Once your identification has been verified, you will be asked to turn your head towards the person testing you. They will take your temperature and document it on the test requisition. They will then insert a thin swab into your nose far enough to reach the back of the nose called the nasopharyngeal area. You will feel the swab being turned and quickly removed back out through your nostril. It literally takes a few seconds. The swab will then be put into a small vial and sent away for testing. Once you are done, you will be directed to return home without stopping anywhere and to remain at home in self-isolation until the swab results are called to you by the public health nurse or the doctor. If the results are negative, you will be directed to remain at home until your symptoms are gone for a full 24 hour period. Remember, this is because there are also other viruses circulating and you will still be able to transmit those to others. If the results are positive, you will be contacted daily by the public health nurse. She will monitor your symptoms to make sure that you are recovering at home. 
If you feel that your symptoms are getting worse, you may be advised to contact your family doctor or go to the emergency department for medical attention. The nurse will also look at the people that you have been in contact with and we will look for them. Those people are those you've been in contact with two days before your symptoms began and up to 14 days after. Anyone that you have been in contact with will also have to self-isolate for 14 days in their own homes or areas within their home if they live with others. Everyone will need to monitor themselves for symptoms and promptly report symptoms to the assessment center nurse. You also mentioned a triage center. Can you ha tell us what happens there? Yes, so if someone comes to the testing, the drive-through test site, and they are really not feeling well, they may be in medical or respiratory distress, the nurse will have the person park their car and they will be assisted into the triage center, which used to be the sports den. Here, they will be helped onto a stretcher and we will assess their temperature, heart rate, their blood pressure, pulse, and their oxygen level. If they do need oxygen, we will assist with that under a medical order. An EMS will be called and the person will be transferred to the nearest emergency room for additional care. It is really important to remember that sometimes with COVID-19, people can become very sick very quickly. So it's important to keep in touch daily and to help and to get help quickly if symptoms are getting worse. I've seen some construction over at that site. Can you explain what's been put in? So we do have a covering now. Um, as you pull in, you'll pull into, it's almost like a drive-through garage, and we've put that there for the privacy of people who are coming in to get tested. We've also put a lot of barriers inside the area and that is to make sure that we have clean areas and dirty areas. Um, with infectious diseases, you always want to make sure that you're separating your clean side from your dirty side to avoid contaminating things like our personal protective equipment. We want to make sure it's in a clean area before we put it on. When we take it off, it has to be taken into a dirty area to be disposed of. And that's to protect anybody working in those areas. So it sounds like our, our uh, people who are doing tests are very well protected then? They are very well protected. The PPE level that they have, there's literally not much of their skin exposed at all. Well, that's good to hear. Can you tell us about um, the testing that's been done so far? What, what are our updated numbers? So as of today, we have tested 145 people. Out of these, we have had 115 negative test results come back. Um, I'm sure everybody is aware that we have had nine positive cases of the COVID-19 virus in our community. All of these cases in the Six Nations Territory were confirmed between March the 28th and April 7th. So sadly, our community has lost one person to COVID-19, and we now have seven of those cases that have been resolved. While these numbers are much lower than surrounding communities, we must, we must remember that our population is also much smaller than our surrounding communities. So right now, our planning team is working on presenting our stats in equal comparison to our neighboring communities so that we can see whether our numbers are truly lower according to our population. We haven't discovered any new cases since April 7th, which is good news, but we must remain on guard. We must continue to practice social distancing and self-isolation as directed in order to prevent any new cases or deaths. We did provide messaging to the community before the Easter holiday weekend. Um, again, stressing the need for families to avoid gathering and exercising social distancing. I know that was difficult for a lot of families to do. Um, so the next two weeks will tell us whether the community actually listened to those warnings and truly practiced social distancing. We do ask that if you or your family continue to gather, 
we would like you to monitor your cells for symptoms for the next 14 days and call the Six Nations Assessment Centre if you develop any one of those symptoms that we discussed earlier. Please remember that testing is the only way to find COVID-19 and placing people in contact with one another in self-isolation is the only way to contain the virus and prevent it from traveling throughout our community. So both of these measures, testing and contacts, um, tracing will help us to protect our most vulnerable people, which are our elders, our knowledge keepers, our babies, and those with chronic medical conditions. And all of this information can be found in daily situation reports we've been producing and sharing on the website and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we also wanted to share it today uh, through the radio for those who do not use the internet. So you've given us some really good information about what happens. Um, if we have a symptom, we call them to the assessment center. Um, if we need extra care, they'll triage us and, and get us the care we need. Um, what, are, what, are, what are the things that we can do to prevent um, getting COVID-19? So there are a lot of things that, that we can do to keep COVID-19 out of our bodies, our homes, and, our, and the community. And I think the, the, the one thing I really want to stress today is to continue to stay home. That is one way to avoid the virus. So the virus is passed from person to person or from objects that a sick person might have touched, sneezed over, coughed over, um, and a person comes along and touches those unclean surfaces and then introduces it to themselves. Um, so if you don't see or you're not out interacting with other people, there's little chance of catching the virus. So it's, it's very important to know that even people who seem healthy and are showing no symptoms can be infected with the virus and they can pass it on to others. And that's because people can actually be infectious up to two days before their symptoms start. So they don't feel sick, but yet they are able to transmit the virus to others. So again, stay home so you won't be responsible for passing the the potentially deadly virus to anybody around you. In addition to that, do not go into public places unless it is absolutely necessary. So if you absolutely must go out for things like maybe a medical appointment or you have to go out to the grocery store, we do ask that one person goes if possible, so go alone and monitor your surroundings. Make sure you keep a distance of two meters uh, from any other person around you. And I just seen walking in the people lined up to get into the bank exercising that. So they've got the distance markers um, on the sidewalk of, of making sure they're not going outside of their area. The other thing again we want to stress is washing your hands regularly and for at least 20 seconds with soap and warm water, especially while you're out in public. I would suggest also people carry hand sanitizer in your vehicle so that when you come back into your vehicle, you're able to clean your hands before you start touching the interior of your vehicle. Remember that it takes at least 20 seconds of hot hand washing to kill any germs, so making sure that when you are um, washing your hands, you're doing it for that correct amount of time. The other thing is cleaning and disinfecting your homes and if you are working, also cleaning your workspaces and your workplaces often, especially the high touch points. And when we say high touch points, we're thinking about those areas in your homes and workplaces that a lot of hands and fingers touch. So things like doorknobs, light switches, uh, remote controls, handrails, taps, toilets, uh, telephones, fax machines, and I think the number one thing we have to look at is cell phones. Everybody has a cell phone. It, it sat anywhere on surfaces. It goes into your purse. You're using it while you're in public. Make sure you're cleaning it regularly. So all of these areas that we talked about should be cleaned regularly with just common household cleaners. 
And the last part is practicing good coughing and sneezing etiquette. Um, so coughing and sneezing into your sleeve or your elbow or a, a tissue. Um, making sure that you throw the tissue into a lined waste paper basket and wash your hands immediately after. And the reason I stress that is I talked earlier about how we can come into contact with uh, viruses on objects. If, if you're sneezing and not covering or coughing and not covering, the, the spray is actually quite a bit, they say up to six feet. Um, so that can cover a lot of area if somebody's not covering up when they're coughing or sneezing. So I spent some time uh, over the weekend making some fabric masks um, for my family. Um, can you comment on, on why the, the recommendations are now coming out about, about wearing fabric masks out in the community? So yes, so we, we talked earlier about how things are evolving as evidence is, is coming to light regarding COVID. And in the beginning, uh, the recommendations were not to wear masks in public um, because they were at that time thinking that, you know, it's, it was easier for you to either not wear it properly or put it down and put it back on your face and introduce um, virus to you, I guess. But now what they're saying is that the, the wearing of masks in public is recommended and it's to protect one another against somebody who might be asymptomatic. Okay. Uh, so it's asymptomatic protection. So if, like I mentioned earlier, people can be infectious for up to two days before they even have symptoms. So if I'm out in public today with a mask on and then I become sick in two days, I, I will have known that I've covered my nose and my mouth while in public and hopefully stopped the spread that route. Having said that, the mask is, is a good idea and it offers that level of protection, but at the same time, we should not think that that's going to protect us in all other ways, for example, washing hands. So while you're out, even though you have that mask on, we still encourage the hand washing and all the other measures. So what if I just wear some gloves? I've seen a lot of people, you know, wearing gloves out. Is that helpful? Um, I see them laying on the ground too that people have thrown them away. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure what, what uh, I've heard that that's better to just keep washing your hands. Yes, absolutely. Because with the gloves, again, I think some people think that that offers them a level of protection so that they then can forget about washing their hands. I mean, the gloves are, are going to prevent the transmission from maybe objects to your hands, but also people need to know how to take them off properly. Um, part of, of the teaching that we've done for healthcare professionals is about how to properly put on personal protective equipment and how to take it off properly. Because a lot of times, healthcare workers become infected by not taking it off properly. Mm -hmm. There's a sequence that has to be followed. We have to wash our hands after we've taken certain pieces of that PP off as well. So for the general public to have gloves on, I mean, if it gives them that level of comfort, that's okay. But along with that, you need to know how to take them off properly and also continue to wash your hands. The gloves will not will not offer protection on its own. So it, it sounds to me like we all have to act like we have the virus and we don't want to give it to someone else. Exactly. Or that other people have the virus and we don't want them to give it to us. Mm -hmm. And that's going to keep all of us um, much safer. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the direction, the advice that we've been given is, is now because we know that it is you know, being transmitted within the community, you have to treat everybody as if they have COVID-19. Okay. Keep your distance, um, you know, and make sure, like I said, when you are going back to your personal vehicle, your personal home, think about where you've been, what you've touched, and, and go into those areas, wash your hands, um, making sure that you're not bringing anything back into your home. Right. Yeah. Treat everybody as if they have it. Okay. 
That's a lot to think about. It's a lot to process. It is. Um, but I think if we each if we each see that it's our own responsibility mm -hmm. to help keep ourselves well and to help keep our families and our community well, um, that that's you know we all have a part to play right. in in this uh, in this pandemic and keeping it away. Um, I've also I've also heard um, about pets. So what about our household pets? Can they get COVID nineteen or can they pass it on to others? Well, right now, the information that we've been provided indicates that there's currently um, limited evidence that pets can, can spread uh, COVID-19. Again, this is an area that is being researched. Um, information may change. But due to the theoretical risk of animals within the household acting as a, a fomite or as a way to spread the virus between people within a household or becoming infected with the virus themselves, um, people who are sick should limit their contact with their household pets if possible. So people who are sick in a home should observe the same type of respiratory etiquette and hand hygiene with the pet as they would do for another person. So if you're sick in the home and we are recommending that, you know, in the home you wear a mask if you have to be around other people, that would go for your pet as well. You know, I know it's hard for for people who are close to their household pets to observe that social distancing. So if you're symptomatic, it's probably a, a good idea to wear a mask if you are interacting with your pet. And again, after handling them, making sure that you're washing your hands. So caregivers may also decide to take the same precautions around pets that have already been in close contact with either a symptomatic case or somebody that is displaying symptoms. And again, these measures may decrease the risk of the pet acting as a source of transmission for the spread of the virus. We also recommend that if you do have pets that are living in the same household as a sick person, um, we should be monitoring them for illnesses as well. So if there are signs of fever or illness developing in our pets and knowing that our host household has been sick, uh, the animal owner should contact their local vet and also just give a call to public health as well. What about um, uh, livestock or, or larger animals or farm animals, I guess? Right, so again, um, anyone that has traveled outside of Canada, uh, the recommendation is that sh they should not visit a farm or handle livestock for at least 14 days after returning to Canada. And that's regardless of their personal health status. So you might be feeling well um, having come and come back to Canada from outside of the country, you should be in self-isolation. But during that time, that also means self-isolating from any type of livestock that you may have. Okay. So we're uh, about a month, I guess, since we declared a state of emergency here at Six Nations um, based on the, the, the pandemic that, that we're now facing. Um, one question that I'm hearing a lot is how long is this going to last um, and what are your thoughts on that? That's a very difficult question to answer because we are still at the beginning of the first wave of, of the pandemic in Ontario and I, I think a lot of people have, have heard that um, spoken of by, by some of our uh, provincial and Canadian leaders. We are in the first wave of the pandemic. so. Really, once a vaccine is made available for the public to provide them with protection from this virus, then we can consider ourselves, um, I guess, more apt to deal, deal with it and a little bit safer. Um, the important thing to remember is that because this is a new virus to the human population, this means that we are all at risk for the virus. Uh, and that is until a vaccine is made available that can can help us to uh, produce antibodies against it. So we do know that researchers are currently working on a vaccine. However, it is projected that, that the vaccines won't be available um, from anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Um, as difficult as that sounds, and that does sound like a long way off, we do have to remember to exercise caution um, with rushing back to our normal way of life. Um, things like the border closures, our own community closure, 
uh, the discontinuation of non-essential services, uh, the closures of our, our schools and daycares, they were all measures that were proven to slow the spread of this deadly virus. And if we lift these measures too soon, we open ourselves back up to the possibility of this virus entering and spreading in our community. So countries and provinces will methodically um, lift some of these measures in the months to come, um, but it will be at the advice of public health officials. So as hard as it may seem, uh, you mentioned that we, we have had to adapt to a new way of life. Um, everything that we are doing today has hopefully slowed the spread of the virus in our community. Having said that though, um, it is concerning that our testing numbers have slowed down. Um, again, I want to stress that we need to test in order to find the virus. So we are strongly encouraging community members to monitor themselves for symptoms of the COVID-19 virus and to please call us at the assessment center uh, so that we can find out what your symptoms are um, and also do some testing so that we can find the virus quickly. Again, if we do find it, we will put any contacts of that positive case into a 14-day self-isolation period um, as they monitor themselves for symptoms. And also asking the community to remember that if any person or home is under self-isolation, they should not be receiving any visitors again, because this increases the chances of the virus traveling from home to home. Um, so if you do have a family member or friend who is in self-isolation, please keep connected with them by phone um, while ma maintaining a physical distance. So there are so many ways that we can keep in contact with our loved ones without being in the same physical space with them. Um, Again, pick up the phone, send a text, maybe Skype or Zoom or do a video chat, but we have to continue with the social distancing um, because really that's the only way that we are going to slow uh, any further spread in our community. Okay, so again, the numbers to reach the Six Nations Assessment Center, 226-446. Uh, 9909 or 1-855-977-7737. I'd also like to remind the community that um, we have other services that are available to the community um, during this time. Uh, Mental Health and Addictions continues to have some walk-in um, availability for support um, or you can give them a call at 519-445-2143. Um, and also we have available emergency food um, support for the community. Um, and I don't have the number in front of me right now, but um, you can find that on our website at sixnationscovid19.ca. Um, we've had a lot of information shared today. Uh, it's really about um, listening to the self, the self monitoring the self the checking on symptoms mm -hmm. it's about um, keeping our ourselves in our homes um, and um, I guess just continuing to wash our hands and um, and, and keep distancing um, but staying connected with each other mm -hmm. through these times um, so we would really like to thank you for welcoming us into your homes today through the CKRZ airwaves um, and I hope you'll be as welcoming each day um, along with Candace Liquors as my support um, I'm going to join you to share some important updates um, and health and safety information that we need to continue to keep our community safe um, let's end this by using this information and staying home to protect the health and lives of everybody we love and also please keep our Six Nations health care providers and emergency service professionals on the front lines of this pandemic in your thoughts and in your prayers. They go to work every day and literally put their own health and safety on the line for you. Please stay home for them. Please stay home for all of us. Yeah. Yeah.